The name of Merlin is forever linked in our minds to King Arthur. One without the other would be unthinkable. The king could not rule without his wizard, his chief counselor, to guide and advise him. Yet until the 12th century, they existed in folk tales as separate, independent characters with no connection whatsoever. Of the two, it is Merlin who seems to belong completely in the land of myth, whereas Arthur crosses from history to myth and back again. Yet there is more actual documentary support for Merlin's historical existence than there is for Arthur's. The magician still has the power to surprise us. Everyone knows about Merlin. He is the archetypal sorcerer, magus, seer. He has supernatural powers, can see the future. Possessing wisdom and cunning beyond human limits, he knows the secrets of the universe and holds the key to the elements. He is a shapeshifter who can fly and become invisible at will. He speaks the languages of all living things and understands the spirits of land and water. Time is no barrier to him. There is a prevalent image of him as a very old man with flowing robes, white hair and beard. This is how he has evolved, but it is vastly different from his earliest appearances in the ancient Welsh legends, where he is instead a wise child with no earthly father, a precociously gifted youth, a wild man of the woods. Merlin's role in the whole Arthurian legend is to add the biggest single injection of uh, supernatural glitz into the story. He is there to uh, provide a, a kind of third level between Arthur and his world and the world of God, Jesus and heaven. In other words, that kind of unexpected, that mysterious factor in life, which some call destiny, some call magic, some call sorcery. Merlin's not only the representative of this, he's actually in control. There is always um, somebody in the wings who is advising um, a chieftain or a king about the politics. You can't do that, you can't do that. There is also a magical advisor. And in the case of a pagan king, there, there would be um, a Merlin. Merlin actually represents most of Dark Age life. He is there, he believes in the mysticism, he believes in the spirits of the woods, the trees, but there is also Christianity. So it proves that Dark Age life wasn't a defined one thing or other, not definitely Christian as we understand it, not definitely pagan as we understand it. You've got a happy mixture of both religions, and it is represented by Merlin. The venerable advisor we recognise as Arthur's guide and mentor is largely a Victorian construction. Thanks to Tennyson and his Idylls of the King and the artistic pre-Raphaelite movement. That Merlin is reminiscent of some ancient schoolmaster, respected but eccentric. We have affection for the old boy, but we have no idea how long he has occupied his position, nor how he got there in the first place. This program will attempt to trace the origins of Merlin, the master illusionist. Merlin emerged into the public eye in the 12th century as if from nowhere. This was thanks to Geoffrey of Monmouth, 
Geoffrey was born in Wales around the year 1100. As a child, he must have been captivated by the ancient Welsh tales of heroes and kings, monsters and gods, bloody battles and weird enchantments. Not surprisingly, he grew up to be a natural storyteller who liked to think of himself as a historian. By entering the church as a teaching canon, he was able to follow his great love of writing and the study of ancient books. At this time, the church was undoubtedly the greatest guardian of all manner of manuscripts and texts. So, Geoffrey's writing career was never short of source material. And of course, the tales of his childhood still rang in his ears like the sound of submerged bells. As a youth, Geoffrey was very familiar with stories and poems about a seer called Miradin. As his first literary effort, he used these to put together a small book, which was, he said, a direct translation of this seer's prophecies from the Old Welsh into Latin. Of course, Geoffrey's educated and influential readership would have been as well able to read Latin as their own Norman French. In fact, to write in Latin was the only option for an author seeking popular success. It was the universal language of literature and the hallmark of a proper education. In the process of translation, Geoffrey turned the name Miradin into Merlinus, known to us as Merlin. He could have substituted a simple D for the Welsh double D and added the Latin suffix us. Miradin would then have become Merdinus, and the prophet, as well as Geoffrey, would have been a laughing stock. Murder is the Latin for excrement to put it politely. Murdenus would have been immortalized as the shitty one. His name would almost literally have stunk. Geoffrey was far too astute an author to burden such a compelling figure as Merlin with a comedy name. This little book was called The Prophecies of Merlin, or Prophetiae Merlini, and the public lapped it up, not as a work of fiction, but as an actual book of predictions about the future, the Nostradamus of its day. So respected was this book that it continued to be consulted in all seriousness for several centuries. That is, until the real Nostradamus came on the scene. In the Middle Ages, people believed the prophecy, read it, uh, and indeed it was even used for, uh, political, for political warfare, so to speak, when Edward I claimed the throne of Scotland. Among other documents which his um, learned um, clerks consulted were, was the prophecy of Merlin and Geoffrey of Monmouth's history, which was, you could interpret it which way you liked. It says things like, when the boar shall uproot the forests of Caledonia, then the eagle shall fly forth, etc. Um, and uh, they were clearly intentionally vague. For a long while, interest in Merlin's prophecies did not fade away. In Italy, Merlin was even given equal footing with the biblical Isaiah. Scholars analyzed his sayings exhaustively. Other writers produced further fake prophecies attributed to Merlin, a practice debunked by Shakespeare when he wrote King Lear. Even as late as the 17th century, the astrologer William Lilly chose to publish his own predictions under the pseudonym Merlinus Anglicus Junior. Naturally, Geoffrey made sure that Merlin, speaking from centuries past, gave some uncannily accurate prophecies about future events. But he also took care so that much of what Merlin had supposedly foreseen was ambiguous, obscure, or downright indecipherable. As ever, Geoffrey probably did include some factual material, but his method was to put pseudo-prophecies in the mouth of Merlin, things that had already happened by Geoffrey's time, like the loss of Henry I's son in the disaster of the sinking of the white ship. To his readers, that must have made Merlin look very genuine as a prophet. It lent credibility to the gibberish that Geoffrey also made Merlin utter in terms of the further future. The earliest form of such prophecies, and one of the early 
Merlin poems is cast like this, is where he prophesies the succession of kings who are yet to come and reign over the, over the island. The surviving versions, of course, are, like most prophecies, worked out backwards, uh, are written at the time of the last king in the list, and then a prophet in early times is made to foretell the kings who will come. And no doubt that happened, but one can't say this must go back to some original form and presumably to genuine prophecies that were uttered. How far those prophecies were received authentic inspiration or accurate, one can't say. Strangely, not one of Geoffrey's readers ever saw through his prophecies after the event. Here is an example of Geoffrey's portentous sounding prophecies. A giant, snow white in color and gleaming bright, will beget a people which is radiant. Maybe Geoffrey got the symbolism from an authentic text, but it is impossible to see where truth ends and fantasy begins. So expertly did he mix the two. But we must remember that Geoffrey did not pluck Merlin out of thin air. Miradin was a genuine historical figure as far as Geoffrey was concerned. He invented the name and initiated the fame that was to turn the prophet of ancient Welsh tradition into an immortal magician. The book of the prophecies of Merlin was so successful that Geoffrey incorporated it into his new work. Called the Historia Regum Britanniae, or History of the Kings of Britain, it purported to reveal the entire early history of Britain with particular emphasis on King Arthur. Though in fact, much of it was legend dressed as history by Geoffrey. Even so, this was to be one of the most important and influential books of the Middle Ages, with far-reaching effects on the course of real history. Into this book, Geoffrey inserted Merlin and his prophecies, adding other information about his life. In this way, Merlin reached an even larger audience, and it was the popularity of the Historia that caused his fame to grow and to spread all across Europe. More importantly, it linked him with King Arthur for the first time, and that proved to be a partnership more powerful and enduring than Geoffrey could ever have imagined. Geoffrey put Merlin's first appearance at the time of Vortigern, a chieftain in the days after the Romans left. As a usurping leader of the Britons, Vortigern had made the fatal mistake of inviting Saxon mercenaries into the country as auxiliary troops against an alliance of enemies from the north. Predictably, the Saxons didn't just do the job they had been hired for. They stayed on and settled more and more of their people on the lands they had been paid to defend. Finally, Vortigern lost control of them as they went on a rampage, massacring the British and despoiling the country. So, Vortigern himself had to flee to the safety of the mountains of northwest Wales. His magicians advised him to build a strong fortress, but the wall was no sooner built than it collapsed each night. In the face of this bad omen, the magicians prescribed the blood of a boy without a father to be sprinkled on the foundation stones. In nearby Carmarthen, they found the young Merlin, whose mother was the daughter of the king of the Welsh kingdom of Diffed. She had been impregnated by an incubus demon while living with the nuns at a local convent. So, Merlin had no earthly father, which qualified him for the role of sacrificial victim. The strange circumstances of his conception meant that he was also a wonder child, product of a union between the earthly and the supernatural, and his powers were soon demonstrated before Vortigern. Merlin demonstrated the shortcomings of the local magicians by correctly identifying the true reason for the collapsing walls, an underground pool in which lay two dragons, one red, the other white, sealed in stone. 
Once the pool was drained, the dragons fought. And, as they struggled for supremacy, a spirit of prophecy took hold of Merlin. Under its influence, he uttered many strange sayings. These were the Prophetiae Merlini that Geoffrey had put in his first book. Merlin explained the red dragon symbolized the Britons, and the white one was their enemy, the Saxons. The white dragon would prevail for a while, but ultimately the red dragon would throw it back across the sea it came from. He foresaw the rise of a leader who would hold back the invaders for a time, meaning Arthur, not yet born at that point. And lastly, after many cryptic predictions, he warned Vortigern that the rightful princes, Aurelius and Uther, exiled offspring of the last Roman ruler, Constantine, were returning to claim back the kingdom and his life. Then he drove Vortigern from the site of the fortress and took it for himself. This act of violence is commemorated at Dinas Emrys, or the Ambrosius Fort near Bed Gellert in North Wales. The rest of the prophecy was swiftly fulfilled. Vortigern was killed and Aurelius took back the kingship. Already Merlin had proved himself, even as a youth, to be greater than any mere court magician. After establishing his credentials, Merlin helped the new king Aurelius to put up a fitting memorial over the mass grave of the murdered British leaders. For this, he travelled to Ireland, where there stood a huge circle of standing stones raised by giants. Using secret arts, Merlin dismantled the circle and had the stones shipped to Britain. At Salisbury Plain, they were re-erected to enclose the burials. That is Geoffrey's explanation for Stonehenge. We can only guess why Geoffrey of Monmouth believed that the great stones of Stonehenge were brought from Ireland. It must be plain that we know that the big stones of which he was speaking are those things that are the main body of the monument. And they came from Wiltshire, about 15, 20 miles north. What seems to have happened is that Geoffrey's people, uh, the people to whom he spoke, uh, knew of similar big stones existing on the plain of Kildare in Ireland, and uh, Geoffrey simply linked them both together. He wasn't much into archaeology, and this was the only lead he had that these stones existed somewhere else, so it made a good story. Merlin went on to interpret the appearance of a comet in the form of a fiery dragon as heralding the death of Aurelius, the ascendancy of Uther, and the coming of King Arthur. He then played his well-known leading part in bringing about Arthur's conception by helping Uther Pendragon to deceive the wife of the Duke of Cornwall into sleeping with him at the fortress of Tintagel. The Duke of Cornwall is away fighting Uther's forces somewhere else in Cornwall and Uther is changed by Merlin magically into the shape of Gorlois, the Duke of Cornwall. Creek gets into Tintagel and lies one night with the Duchess and then goes away. So she never knows that it wasn't her own husband, and that night was conceived the infant Arthur. There's no question in my mind, but that this reflects the theme found over and over again in ancient Celtic mythology, whereby a king is believed to be the son of a god, or the god, Lug, who sleeps with the queen on the night that the, that the new king is conceived. And this was a matter of pride, that kings were each the son of the god. And that with this story is, seems to me, just as told by Geoffrey's, a rationalization of a much earlier, genuinely mythical story. By the time you get to the 12th century, the developed legend of Merlin makes it easy to see where his power comes from. He is demonic. His mum was human. She has a, a red-hot affair with a demon, and Merlin is therefore half a demon. And so he's bigger and stronger than a human being. He can lift gigantic rocks uh, without any difficulty and his magical powers stream from that. So he's a being who exists in the very limit of the human world. He's partly something that isn't human at all, and that easily explains what he does. Apart from the Vortigern narrative, all the other elements were concocted by Geoffrey to add to the Merlin legend. 
Yet in them, there are echoes of real events and real people. Aurelius, for example, is a corruption of Ambrosius Aurelianus, Roman Britain's last general and a contemporary of Vortigern. Also, the site of the mass grave of the British leaders murdered by the Saxons was said by Geoffrey to be near Amesbury in Wiltshire. Amesbury is one of a number of towns and villages in southwest England to carry the distinctive place name element Ambros within it, perhaps indicating the area controlled by the British troops of Ambrosius. As for Tintagel, Recent archaeology has shown that it was an important stronghold with military and commercial connections from Roman times onwards, not an unsuitable place for the begetting of a king like Arthur. These are faint echoes, but audible even now. Geoffrey was just passing them on without understanding their significance. After arranging Arthur's conception, Merlin's story and the Historia came to an abrupt end. For a modern reader, the idea of losing an essential character halfway through the book may come as a shock. But Geoffrey had no more to say about him in that particular book, so perhaps his original source material had dried up. Nor did Geoffrey give any hint that Merlin and Arthur ever met. It would be left to the later medieval romance writers such as Mallory to promote Merlin by making him Arthur's guide and mentor and to elaborate on his supernatural powers. But Geoffrey could take the credit for taking an obscure Welsh seer and transplanting him into the fertile soil of the Arthurian legend. Geoffrey's other achievement had been to present Merlin as a prophet, not in the Christian sense of biblical apocalypse, but in a general spirit of visionary foresight. Merlin made it acceptable to speculate on the future without restriction and opened the door to an army of astrologers, seers and clairvoyants eager to emulate him. One of the most remarkable things about him for a, a student of medieval literature is that in many ways he's a thoroughly unmedieval figure. But by the time you get to Mallory's um, time, the 15th century, he just doesn't fit. He's not a bishop. Uh, he's not a conventional holy man. He's actually something far weirder. He's a magician. And only by suggesting that um, he's part demon and by getting rid of him before the end can you make him uh, digestible in the Arthurian legend. Merlin in the, in the legends is quite an ambiguous figure anyway. You have to remember that Merlin is not Christian. His powers are definitely not Christian. So you're actually dealing with old world magic here from the Roman days, from the Celtic days. So his place in the legends is quite strange. Everything else is so heavily Christian, he is not. But he's, his, his arts, his magical abilities are for the good. They counter the, the magical art from the bad the Mordreds and everything else. He's a counterbalance because Christianity doesn't have too much that is magical in its belief. They need a magical counterbalance to the magic powers of paganism. And he represents this. Towards the end of his life, Geoffrey did return to the story of Merlin once more. Clearly his interest had never waned. For his Historia, he had lifted an account of the child prophet and Vortigern from an earlier 9th century collection of tales put together by a Welsh monk called Nennius. In this earlier version, the young seer was just called Ambrosius, but for reasons best known to himself, Geoffrey decided to refer to him as Merlin, who was also called Ambrosius. He also changed the place where the boy was found from Glamorgan to Carmarthen, because he wanted to emphasize the link between the town's name, Caer Meredin, meaning Meredin's fort, and a prophet called Miradin, after whom it was reputedly named. At that stage, Geoffrey probably knew nothing of the true Miradin other than his fame as a seer and his connection with the town of Carmarthen. 
What he did was a typical writer's trick. He enriched the tale of Vortigern's fortress by identifying that mysterious prophet with the boy Ambrosius. This was to cause him some embarrassment when he returned to the subject of Merlin some years later. In the history of the kings of Britain, Geoffrey makes Merlin prophesied to King Vortigern, the British tyrant, living about 450 AD. But when he comes some 20 years later, 15 years later, to write his life of Merlin, um, it's clear, not that it would be clear to the listeners, because they wouldn't have a history handbook by them, that it's all happening at the end of the 6th century. That's um, what nearly 150 years later. So even by his standards, they couldn't really have been contemporaries. And this was explained away, not um, towards the end of the 12th century, as meaning there must really have been two Merlins, one who prophesied to Vertic Vortigern and one who lived in the forests and went mad, according to the Welsh legend. Although Geoffrey could never bring himself to publicly admit that his Merlin was based on two quite separate figures, he put his freshly acquired knowledge into a new instalment of Merlin's career, a long poem in Latin entitled Vita Merlini, or The Life of Merlin. Beginning after the death of Arthur, the poem restated the northern tales surrounding a real historical figure called Myrdin Wilt, one of the three bards of the ancient Britons, the other two being Anerin and Taliesin. This Merlin is the subject of many early poems and stories, which tell, with some variation, of how he was a warrior bard who fought in a bloody battle in 573 AD at a place called Arthuret near Carlisle. It was a battle between two kings of North Britain, one Christian and the other pagan. It is not clear which side Meredin was on, though the Christian king was said to hate bards. The carnage of that battle drove him insane, and he fled into the nearby great wood of Caledon, keeping away from human contact and living off the fruits of the forest. It was a self-imposed exile in which he suffered the snow and the ice and was unable to escape from his terrified imaginings. According to one version, he even slept with his shield on his shoulder and his sword on his thigh. According to another, he had a little pig for a companion. In the oldest existing document of the Meredin legend, a text of a poem called The Apple Trees in the Black Book of Carmarthen, he was described as having joined the company of other wild men and that he lived in fear of persecution by the Christian king, Riddurich. The amount of detail contained in these narrative poems is unbelievably valuable, given that they probably do give an accurate picture of 6th century Britain, with kingdoms breaking down and constantly warring with each other, a society on the brink of disintegration. But more exciting still is the realisation that these documents provide a very strong basis for belief in the historical Merlin. With a lot of the writings, there is uh, a lot of inspiration that comes through and a lot of people write and write supposedly from knowledge or supposedly from ancient documents, whereas what one could say in the, in the modern language of the Aquarian age is they were channeling. And because of that, it doesn't make it any more or less provable or truth. What you've got is uh, knowledge coming through in one way or another. It doesn't necessarily have to come through um, by the written word. It can come through by the oral tradition or it can come through in a spiritual sense um, through channeling. And I suppose that's a leap of faith. Ironically, it's much more likely there was a real Merlin originally than a real Arthur because the root story, the story of the warrior who goes nuts and acquires the gift of prophecy, refers to a real battle, a battle that's uh, given a date in very early chronicles. It's up uh, on Hadrian's Wall near modern Carlisle. You can actually find the ruins of an old fortress of just that date in just the right place, which almost certainly was uh, the place over which they were fighting. <laughs> 
and this is a struggle between two genuine kingdoms with what seem like historical princes in charge. So the chance is that uh, the prince who died actually had a follower who skedaddled and went mad with disgrace uh, is it, very high indeed. It is unfortunate for the Arthur legend that this Merlin must have lived at least 60 years or so after Arthur's recorded death at Camlan, so they could never have met in the flesh. But their worlds of existence almost touched, and that is remarkable enough. Most people would have been prepared to put money on Merlin as a fictional rather than an actual figure. As we have shown, the evidence points in the other direction, and what is more, it is backed up by some interesting coincidences. The story of Myrodin, as found in the early Welsh poems, was the embodiment of a very ancient concept of the wild man of the woods. This concept can be found as far back as the Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh. There are also Indian tales of wild hermits living in the desert. One good example of the archetypal wild man was the biblical Nebuchadnezzar, who was driven out of the society of men as a punishment for his arrogance. He ate grass, and his hair and nails grew long and unkempt. These exiles into wildernesses, whether of desert, mountain or forest, were usually prompted by some penitential or religious urge. And this was true also of the legends of wild men found in Wales, Scotland and Ireland. There is one Scottish version of the wild man story that runs so close to the tale of Meredin that it must surely be cut from the same cloth. It is to be found in a 12th century biography, The Life of St. Kentigern, compiled by a Cumbrian monk called Jocelyn. He understood the old British languages and was able to make sense of the 6th century world that Kentigern inhabited. Kentigern was busy establishing the Christian church in the Strathclyde area of Scotland from about 570 AD to his death in 612 AD. His patron was the king of Strathclyde, Riddarich, whom the Welsh Myrodin feared so greatly. Both Kentigern and Riddarich are genuine historical figures. He related that St Kentigern met a naked, hairy madman while praying in a wood one day. This madman was called Lailoken, and he told the saint that he had been driven insane because he had been responsible for the bloody slaughter of all the dead at a battle fought nearby. He starts off uh, as a warrior who goes crazy because uh, the lord to whom he's sworn loyalty has been killed in a battle from which uh, the Merlin figure has run. His actual name is Lai Loken, and Lai Lo is what he does. Uh, he goes mad in the woods and gradually gets the sanity back, but with the force of prophecy. And he then wanders back out of the woods and is accepted as a holy man by people. Lailoken later reappeared at one of Kentigan's masses, shouting out wild prophecies. He foretold a new uprising of the Celtic peoples and the death of the king himself. His last appearance before Kentigan was to demand the sacrament as he was destined to die a threefold death that very day by cudgeling, piercing and drowning. Kentigan was unsure of whether to receive this pagan lunatic into the church, but he agreed to give him the holy sacrament. Later that day, Lailakin was attacked by shepherds of a neighboring kingdom who stoned and beat him to death. At the moment of death, his body fell into the river Tweed, where it was impaled on fishermen's stakes as he drowned under the water. The triple death he had seen for himself was fulfilled. He had asked to be buried where the river Pausil ran into the river Tweed, at Drummelzeer, a place with a name possibly derived from old Celtic words for the Dun of Myrodin, meaning Merlin's Fort. <laughs> 
The name Lelakin has a parallel Welsh form, Llalagan, which is coupled with the name Miradin in the Welsh poems and has the possible meaning twin or brother. It seems likely that the legend of Lelakin must have migrated to Wales from the north at some time between the 6th and 11th centuries. It took root in the kingdom of Diffid, and the name Miradin replaced that of Lelakin. How this happened is a mystery, but it all adds up to an impressive body of evidence for the real Merlin, with so many connecting pieces of the verifiable historic past in their proper places. It is therefore possible to say with confidence that Merlin existed as a bard and a prophet in the 6th century, that he was probably not a Christian, and that he was in some way attached to the retinue of the pagan king of Carlisle, Quendalau. Most importantly, he was known by St. Kentigan and hated by the Christian king of Strathclyde. The sum of these facts and implications is inescapable. Merlin, as Meredin, had his origin in the old Celtic kingdoms of the north, not in Wales. Meredin has been so intimately linked with Britain and the British people for so many centuries that it is not surprising that a very old Welsh text describes Britain as Class Meredin, or Merlin's enclosure. This has the sound of an ancient claim to territory and authority, like the force exerted by the Druids of the ancient Celtic world. To complete our search for Merlin, we need to look at the powerful currents of ritual and belief swirling beneath the surface, because unlike stories and even history, they rarely change in the human psyche. We need to understand what drives the ancient traditions. In a glass case in the British Museum, the crouching figure of a bearded man nearly 2,000 years dead sleeps on in a prison with invisible walls buffered with air. Though strangely flattened, his features are startlingly recognisable. His skin has taken on the dark stain of the peat bog which preserved his body in its dark immortality as the sentries pressed down on him. He was found on Friday the 1st of August, 1984, on Lindo Moss, near Manchester. All the modern science that could be brought to bear on him was deployed in order to find out his secrets. Soon it had been established that he lived and died in the 1st century AD, that he had been in prime physical condition, his hair, beard and nails well trimmed and beautifully manicured. He had eaten a mouthful or so of a burnt portion of barley bannock in which tiny particles of mistletoe pollen were present. He was naked from the waist up at least and wore an armband of fox fur. He had received three carefully aimed blows to the head. His jugular vein had been precisely severed to drain his body of blood. He had been garroted with a sinew cord which had three knots in it, first choking him and then breaking his neck. Finally, he had been pitched forward into a pool of water about four feet deep as a symbolic drowning before he was given a final resting place in the peat bog. He died a triple death, just as Meredin Wilt did 500 years later. In 1984, uh, the well-preserved body of half a man was found in a, in a peat bog in northeastern Cheshire near Manchester and was interpreted by some as a sacrificial victim of Druids in the Iron Age uh, and therefore some people have linked him to Merlin because some people now link Druids to Merlin. In fact, the evidence uh, is even more difficult than might at first appear. Some pathologists have challenged the idea that uh, there were a number of wounds upon him which supports the idea of sacrifice. The dating is haywire because uh, bodies deposited in peat box can take on the date of the peat around them. 
And so we may be looking at Merlin, we may be looking at the victim of Druid sacrifice, we may be looking at a mugging victim who's chucked in there by robbers and stripped of his clothing at any time centuries on either side of the date of the Druids. We just don't know. Clues about the real Merlin come from a Celtic world, a world which first came to the attention of classical commentators several hundred years before Christ. Once it had stretched from the Black Sea in the east to Ireland in the west, from the shores of the Baltic down through to the Mediterranean. Though it was never an empire or even a federation of nations, just tribes of people with a shared language and cultural traditions in common. People who traded and communicated across a continent. The Celts had a great feeling for the number three. It reverberated throughout their lives. Their decoration, their art, their poetry. Three classes of learned men, druids, bards and seers. Triskels on their horse trappings, their weapons, the past, the present, the future. Cascades of meaningful threes in everything they saw and did. Including a sacrifice to appease their gods. The triple death was a special ritual, heavy with meaning and not done routinely. The three goes back to what, what we now term maiden, mother and crone, father, son, holy ghost, truth, honor and justice, it doesn't matter. There is always a triad within the whole pagan thing. There is a triad and, and the way we can look at that from a very personal point of view is there is always the male, the female, there is always the sun, the moon, there are always the opposites, but in order to observe and see the opposites, one has to stand at third point in trigonometry. Therefore, there is always a triad and there is always three bards, there is always three magicians, there is always three Arthurian ages, there is always three. Celtic society was held together by the power of the Druids. They were not just priests, but statesmen who controlled the tribes, judges who mediated between chiefs and kings, teachers and bards who held the secrets of the Celtic people in their heads and passed them on by word of mouth only. They dealt in ancient wisdom, and their authority was greater than that of any king they had access to other worlds. All of these attributes can be identified in the career and life of Merlin, whether fictional or real. He was a wise man, a prophet with second sight, a trusted counselor to Arthur, and in the Northern Tales especially, his druidic aspects seem all too obvious. He was a pagan in fear of persecution. He lived apart as a hermit, in a wilderness with only creatures to talk to. He had abandoned his role as advisor and bard to the king through madness. In the fifth and sixth centuries, the Roman decline in Britain had caused an upsurge of Celtic traditions. And, despite the overtly Christian veneer, the old ways, which had never quite disappeared, found new paths back into society. Once again, no king would have felt complete without his druid advisor, bard or seer. This is the echo we hear in Merlin's cave. This is why the Romans tried to wipe out the entire Druid class in Britain. Not because of any religious squeamishness, but because they knew who held the real power in the land. Without the Druids, the Celtic tribes were a people with their heads cut off. There is pretty well no chance at all that Merlin was a Druid. There is no evidence that Druids existed uh, in, the, in uh, Britain after the first century of this era. Uh, they stay much longer in Ireland, but nobody's ever claimed that Merlin was Irish. So the tendency to identify Merlin with a Druid is uh, uh, an example of the modern way in which we try and contextualise uh, our early Christian figures as something pagan, to get a sense of something rooted and organic and natural and continuous in an island in which our present culture is anything but any of those. <laughs> 
The fact that there is somebody in Romano Britain that is claiming to be a druid would have almost been a death sentence. The Romans went out of their way to try and exterminate the druids. What could have actually happened is he could have taken on almost druid abilities without the name because he was in contact with the spirits of the wood, the spirits in the stream. So it would look to us as if he was a druid. The distinction then would have been very startlingly different. He would have not have claimed to have been a druid around anybody that was related to the Romano-British. They were not keen on druids at all. There's no record at all of any violent confrontation between Christians and um, Druids uh, in Britain, uh, and no special reason to think that there was a great confrontation. So it's quite conceivable he was a Druid, perhaps one might even call him the last of the Druids. It would be a mistake to think that because Britain had become predominantly Christian in the 6th century that paganism simply vanished. Merlin manages to be both sorcerer and priest at once, following a lonely path of knowledge like his fellow druids before him. What draws us to him, finally, is our inability to keep him in our sights, like the stag in the forest or the salmon upstream. Merlin's basic pulling power is that he stands in the very limits of uh, what is potential to human beings. And given the fact that to our modern technology, uh, two things are still elusive. One is knowledge of death, and the other is uh, magic in the old-fashioned sense. Uh, somebody who has power over magic is uh, absolutely dazzling. We see Merlin all around us. We, we see Merlin as Gandalf in, in Lord of the Rings. We, we see Merlin everywhere much the same as we, we see Arthur. What we know of either of them as a person is very little. But what we know of their ethics and what we do know is they seem to work well together.